Welcome to Protecting Your Assets, the show about protecting people, property, and most importantly, protecting your ass. I'm your host, Lucky Luciano, and I'd like you to join me for a fast-paced, often fiery discussion about security issues with my co-host, Brian the Angry Man Claimant. Whether we're piercing the veil of security, talking your duty of care, or raving about the latest technology, we'll share our thoughts on the issues, the trends that are impacting security today and into the future. So grab a coffee and join us for our latest podcast, and don't forget to like and follow us on our sponsor's website, brianclayman.com. And now let's talk about protecting your assets. Hello and welcome to Protecting Your Assets. It's Lucky Luciano Cedroni, your host, and with me, Brian, the Angry Man Clayman. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about being prepared. When it all goes bad, do you have a plan in place? What you're going to do? Who are you going to call? Uh, and we're going to get into that shortly. But as always, we're going to talk to Brian and see what's keeping him angry these days. Been well. Anger has been building. I'm happy <laughs> to say that I'm not going to be talking about COVID. I think it's the first time ever. Hallelujah. <laughs> but I am going to talk about there's a nexus to COVID, and that's our prime minister. Uh, I'm going to talk about Afghanistan and the uh, carnage and the uh, situation in Afghanistan right now. I was really disgusted with uh, both the U.S. leader and uh, Canadian leader in their response to what has happened in Afghanistan. I could tell you from the Canadian point of view, I was talking with friends that are in national security and intelligence in the military some uh, journalists that I follow, for months and months and months, they've been saying that we've got to get the interpreters out. We've got to get the people that help Canadian troops out of the country. It was no surprise to anybody that the U.S. is pulling out. In fact, I think it's over a year or so while Trump was here, they announced they'd be pulling yeah. out. The date wasn't a surprise. Uh, the fact that the country was going to fall wasn't a surprise. It was a surprise that it fell as quickly as it did. But the fact that this was going to turn out bad was not a surprise. So I wonder, when I look at the people that lead uh, our government and the governments in the states, was our prime minister too busy campaigning or denying uh, any implication in the Wee scandal to have his eye on the ball to say, you know what, this is going to turn out bad. Why didn't we get our people out a month ago or two months ago? Think about it. Had we done that two months ago, we probably could have gotten everyone up because Kabul was still under the control of coalition forces. There were commercial flights flying in and out of uh, uh, Kabul and the international airport there. We could have put them on Air Canada planes or on uh, Lufthansa or, or American yeah. Airlines, and, any of them, and got them out. Instead of right now, we wait till the last minute. We have to send military aircraft. They forgot to send the special forces troops to protect the aircraft and the people. And uh, uh, it's going to cost us a bloody fortune. And these people are being terrorized and terrified of their situation. It's just another example of uh, uh, government just asleep at the switch, being political and not taking care of business. I am just really beyond angry this week with what I see there, the pictures, the scenes. And, you know, I... Uh, uh, you know, Mark Garneau was interviewed on TV during the week, and he was completely disconnected from what was happening. The things he said were ridiculous, mm -hmm. uh, that, saying that Canada, this is a serious human rights uh, 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 failure, and Canada has a moral responsibility to act. Well, where was the moral responsibility to act two months ago when they could have acted? It's just the double talk amazes me. Yeah, I think the fact that he hesitated that on the question on whether or not they're going to recognize the Taliban government was, was a bit of a problem for him. Um, but I, I agree, it's been a disaster. It's been tragic. You look at the video and it's disturbing to see people climb, climb, climbing onto a plane that's literally taking off only to fall to their deaths a few seconds later. And it's brutal. So I, I there's nothing else to add. I'm going to let it lie where it is with what you've said. Um, my my thing that's keeping me up at night and probably related to some extent to what you were saying about Afghanistan is is the fact that this, you know, great prime minister of ours calls a, an election in the middle of all this, right? We don't have enough on, on our plate. We have COVID. We have uh, the Afghanistan uh, crisis in with the Taliban. We have the Chinese crisis Too with late, our please. Canadians being imprisoned there unjustly and potentially even executed, facing uh, the death penalty. 
And and instead of dealing with those things, uh, you know, our prime minister insists on calling an election because he doesn't like to play nice in the sand blocks at the end of the day, right? He just doesn't want to be accountable to anybody. Um, and that to me is is a big problem. Uh, thankfully, the, the polls are showing that people are, are looking for change. Hopefully it stays that way because Canadians have a habit of doing a U-turn at the 11th hour and sticking with what they've done before. But in this case, I'm sorry, this guy doesn't deserve a free pass. He needs to be canned. Held accountable. And, yeah, held, held accountable. accountable. Like, it's ridiculous. There was one translator, family member, I think was quoted on Global, saying that the prime minister has blood on his hands. And he truly does have blood on his hands. Not just with what's happening in Afghanistan, but with the two Michaels. You know, if you look at how the government under Prime Minister Trudeau has dealt with the two Michaels, what the hell is going on? You know, if the Americans want them, give them to the Americans. Let these feed up yeah. the court process. And, you know, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't understand the intricacies of what's going on with that extradition uh, hearings. But why is this woman under house arrest? Put her in a jail. Make her life difficult. Don't torture her. Don't do like the Chinese are doing to our two Michaels. Yeah. Put her in a beautiful Canadian jail, a nice Canadian jail, but take away her remote and her caviar and yeah. her, you know, this is ridiculous. I, I don't understand what they're thinking. That what, what leverage do we have over China other than the fact that we have uh, this woman? And yeah. I'm not saying that we should be cruel. I'm not saying saying that we don't follow the rule of law. But I got to tell you, Luke, when was the last time someone you arrested got, uh, uh, was out on a bail in a uh, multi-million dollar mansion, someone <laughs> that was as influential as this woman? Quite the contrary, she's getting special treatment, which she doesn't deserve, especially given the fact that our Canadian citizens are not just in jail, they're being tortured. Well, they, they allowed her family to fly over last yeah. year during COVID. Yeah. During yeah. COVID, they allowed her family to come over and visit with her in her multi-million dollar mansion. I wish I had that kind of uh, treatment and support by the federal government. It's it's disgusting, well, you know. Um, they, but anyway, they, that, they that's, allowed, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say they allowed her family to come over. They waived the fact that they had to quarantine. Yet in the town where I live, and they had no problem putting all sorts of small business out, businesses out of work because COVID was so dangerous. But to let the, her family come from uh, a country... Uh, that was uh, an epicenter of COVID, at least at one point, and just forego all the health regulations. This is under the current government. I, um, I I really hope Canadians hold them to account. Let's hope so. I'm holding my fingers. I'm not holding my breath because I'd probably die if I did that, but I'll cross my fingers and do that. Yeah. Um, and so with that, let's move on to the topic of discussion. It's going to be short and quick today, but I think it's important for us to uh, to touch on the recent shooting, uh, well, in particular in Sherway Gardens this time around, and Brian, you want to share the specifics of that if, if, if you if you know them, because I'm not that familiar with it. But at the end of the day, it does speak to uh, our overall theme, which is basically the importance of being prepared, because you never know when this type of stuff is going to happen. And I will say, before we get into that, I have seen a disturbing um, trend that's, that is that is connected to this discussion, and that is, um, you're not a big soccer fan, I know that, <laughs> but... Um, I've, I've seen a number of sporting events. I've seen it in baseball, major, major league baseball last week. Uh, just saw it in hockey. Um, I've seen it in uh, soccer in particular, mostly in Europe. But this trend all of a sudden towards all-out fights and brawls mm -hmm. in the stands. Right? Like you would never see that in the football, in a baseball stadium. Certainly that's rare. But you're starting to see that. And I don't know what if it's because of COVID or whatever. But all of a sudden the crazies are coming out. And I think that, you know, that ties into what we're going to talk about. Treat, you know, not everyone's got to carry a gun, but you got a, a, a mob in your mall. you got the same type of problem. you got to be prepared and you've got to be able to react. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, the soccer thing, I guess, is due to all those uh, Italian hooligans that are going through. <laughs> or is that the British? I'm not sure. I always mix <laughs> you two guys up. So anyways, Sherway Gardens, for our listeners that may not be familiar, is a pretty large uh, shopping mall in Toronto in the West End. Right, Luke? If not yeah, for, uh, bottom of the 427. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Toronto. And they had uh, last week an incident where shots were fired uh, inside the mall. Uh, there was a fight between two groups. It was not an active attacker situation, as several people suggested, but it was shots uh, fired. 
Uh, I think one, at least one person was hurt, uh, a bad guy. There were no innocents hurt. But it put them all into a lockdown for most of the day. It was a major police operation. And it was a reaffirmation of there before the grace of God go I. A little bit about Sherway Gardens. It is a mall operated by Cadillac Fairview. Cadillac Fairview as a company uh, uh, really takes security protection uh, th their duty of care obligation very, very seriously. And they have one of the better security programs in the commercial real estate industry. By all accounts, just watching TV, seeing the chief of police at his news conference, uh, it was a great response by police. It was a great response by the mall administration, a great response by security. Everyone worked in partnership. Everyone knew what to do. And a situation that could have turned out a lot worse uh, was resolved in relatively short time with uh, minimal casualties and the mall was able to reopen shortly thereafter. So it's sort of an example of uh, of uh, uh, the importance of being prepared because the plans went into place immediately. The police knew what they had to do, security knew what they had to do. The problem I've got, Luke, is that regrettably that seems to be a uh, the exception rather than the rule. And I say this from a couple of points of view. When I worked as a director of security uh, of uh, GWO Realty Advisors, uh, I had lots of properties across Canada that did not have proper plans in place. So we're not prepared to deal with the unexpected. And in fairness to my old uh, alma mater, this wasn't just a problem we had. It's typically an industry problem where security is not taken seriously until after something happens and then it could be too late. So the question I want to throw out to you, Luke, uh, and, and maybe we could talk about this, is uh, what do you think the state of preparedness is in commercial real estate at malls? Do you think what we saw at Sherway Gardens with Cadillac Fairview or even the Eaton Centre a few years ago with the shooting that they had, do you think that's typical of what the security response would be? Or are those the exception, the outliers? I, I think it, they are the exception to the rule, but I don't think that overall that benchmark is as bad as 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 we might we might think. And what I mean by that, you know, we talked about it with Chris on the last episode. Uh, you know, the lack of training it, it really is a, a bit of a tough spot to develop competent training when you only hold on to those guys for a short time period. Um, and I don't want to get into that whole, you know, the money and you pay and the expectations, but the reality is they don't get as much training as they should. Uh, so it is difficult for them to be able to respond at a level that, you know, would be comparable to the police, for example. But the police get to do that every day, really. They're reacting to emergencies all the time. So they, they constantly train what the response uh, response should be. Um, and, and security guards don't typically get that, that luxury. Um, so I think given that sort of reality, they tend to do a pretty good job at the bigger, higher profile properties. So to your point, I don't see mid mid range shopping malls having that same type of capacity. Most of them might have a couple of security guards running around, usually minimum minimum pay and minimum minimally trained. So, uh, you know, from, but well, if we stick to the to the Cadillac Fairviews, the you know Mall of America, for example, is a great program there. From what I've heard, never been there, but I've seen plenty of their training programs. There are malls out there that are doing it right. Um, and I can tell you a neighbor of mine, they had the unfortunate uh, experience a couple of years ago at Vaughn Mills, where similarly, uh, a couple of idiots broke into, uh, they, they attacked um, a jewelry store that she happened to be walking by. Um, and But she was very complimentary of the guard guard force on scene at that, at that time. And the retailers, obviously they have done their training at that mall and she, they were quick to grab her, throw her into one of the, the other retail uh, cubicles or whatever you want to call it, uh, spaces and roll down the doors and secure her behind the, behind the doors. So it actually worked the way it's supposed to. But I know that that mall in particular practices that all the time and they train all the time. I don't see most malls doing that. But I think that's the problem. I yeah. think uh, uh, malls that are aware of the threat and the risk, okay, that have done a proper threat risk assessment and realize the possibility, you know, we're talking two different things here. You know, everyone likes to talk about active attacker and terrorism. We're not talking about being prepared for terrorism, but we should. We're not even talking about active attacker and we should. We're just talking about two people having a fight in a public place yeah. and uh, with the likelihood that there could be weapons involved, I think, and being prepared for that. 
you, you know, you said a lot about, uh, uh, you know, security guards, turnover. And again, we're not going to get too much into that right now. But I really see it a bit differently than you. I think that mall operators and building operators have an obligation that if there is a likelihood, they have a duty of care obligation. If there's a likelihood, if it's reasonable that the emergent situation such as the fight or shooting could occur, it behooves them to make sure that their guards are trained, that yeah. their guards know what to do. Because other than that, that's just an excuse. And if what that means is you got to move from guards that are paid minimum wage and they transition every three months to another company, so be it. That's what you got to do. Because when I go to a uh, 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 the football game and if I hurt my finger and I go to the first aid tent, I'm not expecting to get, to get the same level of medical treatment that I would get from Sunnybrook at the trauma center. So you, you've got to be prepared for what's likely to come through the door. I think Sherway Gardens, from what I know, did an excellent job. I think they did an excellent job. And look, you would know better than I because you used to work at Cadillac. But I think they did an excellent job because they thought about this. They were prepared and they trained for it. Mm -hmm. Would you not agree? Because I think the failure with a lot of other organizations is not that they're stupid, not that they don't care but they don't think about it, nor do they perhaps have a security leader, which is putting it in front of their face and doing what he or she needs to do to make sure they are adequately prepared. Yeah, and I think there needs to be a genuine commitment to be prepared. And what I mean by that is, you know, we talk about training. Well, training is in itself, you know, what do you mean by training? Training isn't just reading a, a, a policy and saying, you know, I've done it now. There's my my response to an act of the, an active attacker or a fire escape or whatever it is, you read the policy and, and that's that's training. That's not training, right? Like real training is walking them through it, right? As we've done with some of our clients in the past, taking them through the exercise, building the program, making sure that the response makes sense for that particular client, for that particular space. But then you got to walk through it and regularly. You've got to do that that simulated walkthrough uh, to understand where the gaps are, where the where it can be improved. You only find that out by walking through the the, the, the testing, the, the tabletop exercise. I don't like, I'm not a big fan of tabletop exercises, but that's better than just reading the plan. Yeah. Right? But if you, ultimately, I think the best way to train is to actually do it for real, right? Like simulation. And the problem is, as, as we've experienced in our previous lives and even as consultants, the clients often have a real difficult time having to say to tenants, you know, we need you to shut down operations for, you know, 15 minutes. And let's walk through this train, right? It's always, mm -hmm. oh, that has to wait till the weekend or that has to wait till after hours. And at that point, the training really loses its value because it's not real anymore. You're, you're doing that training session in an empty mall, right? There's nobody there. You're not going to experience the panic. You're not going to experience the, the, the number of people that are going to get in the way of your responding officers in terms of what they have to do, how long it's going to take them to get someplace. Yeah, and, it, you know, we've got to get away from this epiphany because it seems it's been our experience, you know, in our practice that uh, the customers that come to us and ask for help with emergency preparedness usually have had some sort of emergency that happened that yeah. weren't prepared. And then they have an epiphany saying, boy, we should be prepared. But almost like COVID and with these anti-vaxxers, it almost seems like every single anti-vaxxer in the world has to get COVID and make a YouTube video and say, I was wrong, you should get the vaccine. We can't do the same thing with every mall in the world. Like we know as security professionals and every security professional knows that certain locations, high profile locations are at a greater risk just by virtue of the fact that you've got the public going through there. When we worked in a financial district uh, uh, in the path in the morning, we could have 60,000 people an hour going through the underground path through our buildings, each of our buildings. Well, what happens in any town of 60,000 people? There's good guys, there's bad guys, there's stuff that happens and there's stuff that works out really well. You've got to be prepared to deal with it and that's really a weakness. And I would suggest also, if we talk about duty of care obligation, and that's something we've talked a lot about over the uh, many podcasts, we've done in the last year. Duty care obligation is under tort law, civil law, basically saying that a operator has to be prepared to keep people safe, keep people and property safe from things that are foreseeable, reasonable, and plausible. And if you're a mall operator or a major office tower operator, it is foreseeable that there's going to be a fight. It's foreseeable and plausible there's going to be a, a medical emergency. 
be, it's possible there could be an abduction or a crime. What is your plan? And if you don't have a plan right off the get go, you're guilty. You're, you're, you're guilty. You know, some clients say, well, look, you know, we're just going to call the police. We, we don't want that responsibility. Here's the deal. If you try and you fail, you might be negligent. If you stand there and do nothing, you're grossly negligent. You don't want to be grossly negligent. You, you, you know, you've got to make an effort. You, and, and, and there are resources out there to help people uh, uh, make an effort to be prepared. One more thing I want to say about this. I noticed uh, with my network of uh, security professionals, uh, several after the shooting were talking about active attacker. Active attacker is different than a fight with two guys shooting at each yeah. other. Active attackers were a stranger in a building for maybe some political motive or some uh, social motive is engaged in actively killing whoever he sees. And it usually goes on for a few minutes with a high casualty rate. This wasn't that. So we do ourselves a disservice, I believe, as security professionals when we respond to something like this and say, are you trained in active attacker? Yeah. This isn't an active attacker. Are you trained in emergency management? Are you trained to shelter in place? What is your communication strategy? We're not talking about setting up uh, SWAT teams and shooting bad guys here, but there's a ton of things the mall manager needs to do, a property manager needs to do when something like this is happening. And if you don't, it's not going to turn out good. Yeah, it's it's very much like uh, the use of terrorism, right? Everything's a terrorist attack, but yeah. there's, they're not terrorists. Like there's a defined, there's, there's defined parameters of what constitutes a terrorist, a terrorist attack and terrorist tactics. And anybody can use terrorist tactics. Yeah. Doesn't mean you're a terrorist. Um, so that intermingling of words is very important to your point because it makes you understand what the threat really is. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not actually uh, Al Qaeda. It's some guy in his basement who thinks he's Al Qaeda. And that's a totally different perspective uh, of, of how to prepare for those types of situations. Um, and I think. It's important too because the way you termed it, when you say active attacker, I think a lot of organizations have this vision of, yeah, a guy with a gun coming in there. And it's, they, I think that that's viewed as so unlikely uh, as opposed to saying, well, actually, it could be just a guy having a fight, like you said, a couple of guys having a fight, which is a lot more likely in, in an office environment or more palpable for them to understand that because that's something that they can probably, they've probably seen that many times. And they can associate to that more readily as something that's plausible in their space versus a guy walking in with a gun out of the blue and starting to shoot people. Something they probably don't even want to acknowledge as possible. Well, so I you're think right. terminology is very important. It is important, but it's important, you know, dead is dead. And whether you're dead by an active attack or by a nuclear weapon, by a snake that bites you or by some mug or dead is dead. So, uh, you, you know, the labels are less important. But I got to tell you, you, you said something interesting that... Uh, uh, some managers or property operators think it can never happen to them. And you know what? They're probably right in the sense that the likelihood of being the victim of a terror attack in Toronto or even active attacker attack is not that high. I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over it. But what is high is that we're in buildings, and this actually happened to me, we're in buildings that uh, house five, six, seven, ten. 15,000 people and each one of those 5, 10, 15,000 people, uh, not each one, but many of them has significant others. They have, so, so your five or 10, if they're married is now 20, uh, 10 or 20,000 and they've got children, you, you know, so nuclear families, 40,000. I did a case years ago where one of our tenants was a major financial institution. They had thousands of employees in our complex and there was a threat of a shooting by the Hells Angels against the tenant. This tenant was a major financial service organization, globally known. So the first thing I started thinking is, why are the hell's angels after this tenant? Like, I, I don't get it. And when we did the investigation, we found out what it was is that there was a, uh, a employee, a female employee, worked in the accounting section of this uh, fintech financial services company. Her dad, lived in Toronto and York region, and he had some properties that he was renting to some guys that were assholes and weren't paying the rent. So he evicted them. It turned out they were bikers. And they said, you'll be sorry. And he says, well, I'm not scared of you. <laughs> He's a brave old guy. Yeah. So he says, you've got a daughter. Maybe she's scared of us. So all of a sudden, this threat that had nothing to do with this building in the financial district that took place in northern York region, okay, was now on Bay Street. Yeah. A building of 7,000, and there was a real possibility of this bad guy or these bad guys coming in, 
doing harm to this woman. What happens when that happens? If you remember when Toronto police, I forget how many years ago, at Union Station shot yeah. that guy that took a TD hostage. Bank. That started the TD Bank and that started as a domestic and he came there to kill his wife. You don't want people in shopping malls killing wives and killing people because once they finish killing them, they kill anyone else that gets in the way. So to get back to what you said that, you know, some leaders don't think it's really possible and they're not worried about it. They got to worry about it because this stuff happens and that's why the label is less important. You know, Al-Qaeda coming into your building, not really sure. A disgruntled husband or wife coming into your building, a lot higher. What's the plan? And I don't think we're prepared. And that's sort of the motto of the day. Be prepared. The Boy Scouts had it right, you know. Well, and I, one of the, the 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 disappointing trends I've I've noticed in the last few months, and it's probably, I mean, I would like to think it's mostly due to COVID because everyone's locked up in their homes and hasn't been downtown. But I have been down there a few a few times now uh, in the last couple of weeks and, and met with security managers and, and spoken with them. And I'll tell you, one of the disappointing things is that that they seem to have reverted back to the, you know, what used to be down there before you and I got down there, that there was that mentality of sheltering in place, just worrying about what goes on in your four corners. And that's really all it takes to protect your building, to protect your business. But the reality is that that's not, that's not the case. Modern progressive security thought leadership and practitioners, I think if you are worth your salt in terms of your, you know, your value, you're looking at the strategic uh, um, the strategic uh, overview of where you're operating. It's not just about your business in Toronto. It's about what interacts with that business globally. It doesn't have to happen. You know, to your point, something could be happening in Afghanistan right now, like it is, and that could tri tri uh, trick something or trigger somebody here to do something against your business because you happen to be saying something in support of, you know, the allies or something against the Taliban and. You have got to have eyes to that. It doesn't mean that you've got to have a, every every business needs an intelligence agency, but don't be naive enough to think that I don't need to know what's going on beyond the, the borders of my property because everything that's going on beyond that border is actually going to integrate or influence what goes on within your borders. You know, to that point, I used to, uh, when I would con be confronted by a, a senior leader of the organizations I worked for or I was dealing with, and uh, they would ask me, so look, why are you concerned, you know, so much about security? We got security guards down here, you know, in the building. So I usually run this uh, 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 scenario with them and I say, okay, walk in the building. What do you see? Well, I see a security guard. I see a concierge. Okay. And close your eyes now and pretend you hear screaming. He's got a gun. Or close your eyes and protect you hear, pretend you hear screaming saying, he's dead, he has a heart attack, or there's someone shooting. Now open your eyes and look at those security guards and concierge and tell me, do you feel safe? And if the answer is no, if you don't feel that these guys can take care of business, and I'm not saying tackle the gunman, put him in handcuffs, but would know how to uh, uh, issue, uh, send out the alarms, yep. how to call 911, how to start evacuating. If the answer is no, you have nothing but an illusion, an illusion of security, a facade. So again, I think we've got to get back to basics. We've got to say, why do we have security? If it's to meet and greet, if it's to be the face of the organization, sorry, don't have security, get yourself concierges, get yeah. yourself people that are touchy-feely, nice smiley. Security is like life insurance. You never dust off your plan until you need it. Security should be like that. There's all sorts of other value adds it brings to the table. Don't get me wrong. They can be the ambassadors of, of the course. building. They can't give out an umbrella. Don't get me wrong. But that's not the that should not be the primary role. That's a secondary or tertiary role. But unfortunately, too many people think when you ask them why do you ask security, that's what the answer, yeah. and that's the problem. Cadillac Fairview again. You know, I I, I have many colleagues from Cadillac Fairview. I have a lot of respect for the program. They don't see security as touchy-feely. They see that as a component, but security is there to protect the asset and people. They got it right, and I think we as, a, as an industry, the contract security industry, we have to raise the bar. There's still a lot of work to be done. This could have turned that, out completely different. <laughs> and on that note, I think we've got it short and sweet today. That was a good, quick discussion. I think uh, to our listeners and our business leaders in, per in, in particular, the importance of being prepared, 
starts with getting a good assessment or an understanding of what the risks are in your particular business. So let's start with that. Step one, get an assessment done. Step two, understand where your risks are and where your threats are, and then you can develop a program to respond appropriately to those risks. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn over to my, to, to my colleague, Brian, for a final thoughts and a goodbyes. I just think you're right. I think it starts start at the beginning, a threat risk assessment, understand the threats, understand the vulnerabilities, and then engage a competent, uh, impartial third-party security consultant to help walk you through it. Come up with a plan, and then you too, God forbid, should it happen to you, will be like Sherway Gardens or the Eaton Centre and survive to talk another day, should this happen to you. And with that, well said, we'll leave it at that. Until next week, folks, take care, stay safe, and be prepared. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. That concludes this podcast. We hope you enjoyed listening and will join us in a couple of weeks for our latest episode. Please remember to like and follow us on our sponsor's webpage, brianclayman.com, where you can leave us your comments and suggest topics you'd like to hear about in future episodes. Until next time, thanks for listening and don't forget to protect your assets.